Hello, everyone. I welcome you all to the third event of Young Scholars Exposure, organized by JBS PDF. The speakers of today's evening are Shrija Datta and Shayan Datta. But before I introduce them and, the and their talk titles, I would like to welcome our reviewers of the day. Uh, on our panel today, we have as our first reviewer, Dr. Shulalit Bandhubadhyay. Dr. Shulalit Bandhubadhyay is a JB scholar of the year 2006. He is an associate professor within particle engineering and hydrometallurgy at NTNU. And he's also a researcher at the Department of Water Management, TU Delft, Netherlands. He earned his PhD in chemical engineering and currently is a member of the Gemini Center within hydrometallurgy, HYPROS. He worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Chemical Engineering, NTNU, and the Department of Water Management, TU Delft. Before joining Jotun in 2017, he was working as a postdoctoral researcher at TU Delft and UNESCO IAG. He graduated with a B honors in chemical engineering from Jadavpur University, India, and was awarded the Erasmus Mundus Fellowship to do his MSc in chemical engineering at NTNU, Norway. Dr. Shulalit Bondabadhi, we welcome you once again. It's lovely having you on the panel. Our second reviewer of the day is Dr. Tonmoy Sanyal. Dr. Tonmoy Sanyal is a JB scholar of the year 2008, and currently he is a postdoctoral scholar working with Professor Andre Sali at UCSF. He develops Bayesian inference-based methods to improve integrative structure determination of protein complexes using IMP. He completed his PhD in chemical engineering with a minor in computational science and engineering from UCSB in the year 2018. In his thesis, he developed novel coarse-grained models of liquid mixtures, polymers, and protein folding for efficient molecular dynamic simulations using variational inference techniques. Dr. Shanel, we welcome you on the panel today. Now that we have introduced our reviewers for the day, let me move on to the first speaker of the evening. Uh, the title of Shayan's talk is Finding All the Pytho Pythagorean Triples. And Shayan is an undergrad student as well, who is majoring in mathematics at uh, Iser Kolkata. He's interested in number theory and combinatorics. He further enjoys computer programming, especially in C++, Python, and MATLAB. He seeks particular pleasure in compiling his thoughts with simple words, as he is immersed in the vast world of literature and the study of chess theory. Shine, we welcome you. You can share your screen whenever you're ready. While Shine does so, let me explain the rules uh, uh, that we'll proceed with. So each speaker is going to get 20 minutes. And they can finish before 20 minutes, but we request the speakers to not exceed 20 minutes. Uh, after that, uh, we'll briefly open the floor to the audience for any questions and queries from the audience. So we'll dedicate five minutes for that. And then each of our reviewers on the panels will be given 10 minutes to review the presentation that was presented by our speakers. Thank you. Shaya, whenever you're ready. Okay, so uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, finding all the Pythagorean triples, as I have already mentioned. So, going, uh, <clears throat> go, uh, I am Shayan Dotto, I am from Isa Kolkata, and I will be delivering a talk on this today. Uh, so, our idea is so uh, the main idea of this talk is to find all the integer solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared equal to z squared as we know that uh, x, x, x squared plus y squared equal to z squared is the famous uh, uh, theorem of pythagoras and we want to find all the integer solutions to this equation basically in other words we want to find uh, all the integer sided right angle triangles all the right angle triangles with all sides are integers but uh, the first Okay, so the first step that we take to do this is to realize that if x, y, z is a solution of this equation, 
then lambda x lambda y and lambda z are also solutions for any integer lambda so you can just substitute lambda x instead of x and lambda y instead and so on to see that they are indeed solutions so instead of finding all the solutions we will only focus on trying uh, fo we will only focus on uh, finding solutions with gcd of xyz equal to 1 because once we have the solutions with gcd of xyz equal to 1 we automatically have all other solutions we only need to multiply by integers lambda so so the solutions of this equation which satisfy of this equation which hello um yes shayan i think uh, there's a problem with your internet connection uh, if you could maybe shift to a stable internet connection if that's uh, possible i don't know it's, it's you can switch off your video and continue that's okay I, I hope it's better now. Yeah, yeah, please continue. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So all the, these solutions are called primitive solutions. And uh, now comes our second trick. There is one uh, trivial solution, which is a zero, zero, zero solution. We will not care about that solution anywhere in this whole talk today. So we will always assume that Z is not equal to zero. So if z is not equal to zero, then we can divide by z and transport this equation into x squared plus y squared equal to one, which as all of us know is an equation of a circle. And any rational point on this circle, that is any rational solution to this equation, corresponds to an integer solution to the previous equation. In Or in other words, any integer solution to the previous equation corresponds to a rational solution to this equation. So we only need to find all the rational solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared. solutions to the equation the screens are uh, simultaneously visible so here we have our one i'll request you not to dwell much on the equations written on the left hand side because there are some spoilers in those equations so uh, just like only look at the right hand side where the geometry is going on so here we have the circle and uh, to find all the rational points uh, we are, we first we will note that minus 10 is one such rational point so let's point uh, plot minus 10 on our uh, on the on, on our picture here's minus 1 comma 0 on our picture and if uv is another rational solution to 2 let's say u comma v is another rational solution to 2 so we will join uv and minus 10 to get this equation y equal to v by u plus 1 times x plus 1 and this equation is basically this only written in a different language this equation and <clears throat> it touches the circle at the point uv as you can see it uh, this is the point uv and the line goes to minus 1 comma 0 and u comma v so this is the point uv by the way and it goes to minus 1 comma 0 and u comma v and this line has a slope t equal to v by u plus 1 i hope you remember that the slope of a line is the tangent of this angle so this this line has a slope t equal to v by u plus 1 and that's why this equation is written with a t because it's easier to write this equation down with a t and uh, we will now look at where this line intersects the y axis so this line as you can see this is the y axis which is x equal to 0 and it intersects y axis at zero at the point 0 comma t so we can check it algebraically as well we can just go through the algebra and decide that it's 0 comma t where the point uh, intersects and since u and v were rational, v, v by u plus 1 is also rational, which means t is rational, which means 0, comma t is a rational point. So, uh, so this is quite a surprising result, if you have not realized till now. That is, if uv is a rational point and we join uv and the point minus 1, 0, then the point at which it meets the line is also a rational point. This is, this is quite an important result. We will need this. Now we will go into another thing. We will show that if this point is rational and if we join a rational point and this point minus one zero and if we extend it and allow that line to meet the circle at some point that point will also be rational so 
this is what we will show now. We will show it algebraically. We will, we will not dwell much on the algebra because so the converse is also true, which means that given a line of slope t, the line through minus one comma zero with slope t is given by y equal to t into x plus one. And if you plug this into two, two was the equation of the circle x squared plus y squared equal to one. We will get the solutions for this x, and using this x, we can get the solution y. So that's why this was a spoiler. That's why you see this point was named one minus t squared by one plus t squared, comma two t by one plus t squared, because it's easier to plot this point this way. So this is this is our rational treasure. Now that we know this is our now we know that all the rational points on the straight line y on the y axis corresponds to all the rational points on the circle. Well, not all the rational points. All the rational points minus minus one comma zero. So all the rational points on the circle are in a one-on-one -one correspondence with all the rational points on the line. So now that we have our geometry in hand, we can uh, go back to the algebra. Mostly now it's not, not that much of algebra. Now it's not that much of geometry anymore. So now we have the rational solutions. We can use them. Now we need to find the integer solutions. We have the rational solutions. We want to use them to find the integer solutions. So Here's to find the integer solutions. We need to use something called modular arithmetic. And since I was asked to make this talk as elementary as possible, I decided to introduce a few notions of modular arithmetic. In case you know it, you don't need to go. You don't need to pay attention to this slide. But it's only that if uh, this these three lines are read as congruent to, and if A is congruent to B mod M, this simply means that A minus B is divisible by M, or A leaves the remainder B when divided by M. This is just a fancy way of writing it, and here are some exercises. These are very standard exercises in modular arithmetic. One of them says that uh, congruences can be added just like uh, ordinary equations. Other says that congruences can be multiplied just as they are ordinary equations. And the third one, this one we will need very, this one we will use quite a lot. That is, square numbers are always congruent to zero or one mod four. That is, square numbers when divided by four will either leave a remainder zero or leave a remainder uh, one. So you can try this exercise out, but here's a neat trick, neat geometry to see that this is indeed the case. So just just give me a moment. Here's a neat trick to see that this is indeed the case. This is an animation made by a friend of mine. Uh, it's called Satik Saha, and this animation basically shows that like here's an even square which is congruent to zero mod four, and Here's an odd square which is congruent to one mod four. If you sort of delete this middle square, then you are left with uh, then you are left with four equal parts, which is which shows that it's congruent to one mod four. So if you divide it by four, you get four equal parts, and then there's one part left. So you can prove that algebraically as well. That's not a very hard algebra to prove. But uh, this this is this is all the modular arithmetic we will need. So we will look at which which are the cases that are possible. We will look at the Integer solution congruent. Uh, we'll do, uh, look at the integer solution congruent mod four. So can x and y both be even? Not really. If x and y both are even, x squared plus y squared is even, which means z squared is even, which means z is even, which means the series of x y z is at least two, which contradicts the fact that it's one. We sort of started with this one. Uh, can both of them be odd? Not really, because if x squared is odd and y squared is odd, then x squared is congruent to one mod four, y squared is congruent to one mod four. Which means x squared plus y squared is congruent to two mod four. Which means z squared is congruent to two mod four. Which is a contradiction because squares cannot be congruent to two mod four. Can one of them be odd and the other be even? Yes, they can be because uh, three, four, five, and four, three, five are one such solution. So as you can see, there's a uh, symmetry between x and y. So we can assume that one of them is odd. In particular, we will assume that x is odd and y is even. At the end, we can just interchange the roles of x and y and say that if y is odd and x is even, we have another set of solutions. So now we will have some algebra which will not dwell much. If you ever, if you feel like there's any step that you are confused with, feel free to say something. So I'll not go over this algebra. We will see that if a point y is parameterized, we want to parameterize it by t and write it in lowest terms. Then we can just plug this t equal to m by n in our original equation where we found that x was one minus t squared by one plus t squared and y was two t by one plus t squared to get these two equations. You can check all of these if you don't believe me. So these are these two equations. So there exists an, an integer k which satisfies these properties. These are really very very elementary algebras. So if that is true, then k divides m square minus n square and k divides m square plus n square, which means k divides their sum and their difference, which means k divides two, which means k is either one or two. 
but k cannot be 2 because if k was 2 2x would have been congruent to uh, 2x would have been m square minus n square which means 2 would have been congruent to m square minus n square mod 4 this is again a contradiction because square numbers can be either 0 or 1 mod 4 so m square minus n square can never be made uh, to be 2 like it can either be 1 or 0 or uh, minus 1 which is basically 3 mod 4 so we must have k equal to 1 so now that we have k equal to 1 we can plug it in our original solution and here we have all the solutions of the pythagorean all all, all uh, Pythagorean triples with x odd, all the primitive Pythagorean triples where x is odd and y is even. We can interchange the roles of x and y and find all primitive solutions with y odd and x. Even. So these are the, you may remember this solution from high school. This was this was a solution you you may remember the solution from high school, but uh, you, you may have done the uh, you may have show, proved that this is this is really a solution to x square plus y square equal to z square. But what we added in this talk is that all the solutions of x square plus y square equal to z square corresponds to this solution corresponds to this uh, form uh, that's what i mean so now that we have a final parameterization we will go into some jargons because that's what we need the most uh, after with, with with great math comes great jargon so as you might have realized a rational point is a point of the form p comma q where p and q are rational rational lines are those of the form ax plus by plus c equal to zero with abc belongs to q that the coefficients are rational Rational conics are those of the form x squared plus by squared plus dot dot dot. That is a conic with all the uh, with all the coefficients rational. That's what we call a rational conic. So there are some observations. A line passing through two rational points is a rational line. These are very easy exercises. You can just try to show that these are true. You can just write two equations down, solve them, and see that indeed two two rational lines always intersect at a rational point, and a line through two rational points always is a rational line. A rational conic and a rational line may not intersect at rational points. You can even show this. You can try designing, constructing a conic and a line and seeing the, uh, and proving that they may not intersect at rational points. So what we did in this thing that we have shown just is that we took one rational point minus one comma zero, and we projected the circle on the rational line y-axis. This projection is known in mathematics and otherwise areas as a stereographic projection. This is a special type of projection, but uh, well, yes, that's. Uh, it's just called a stereographic projection. So yeah, now that we have one, we know answer to one question, we want to generalize our answer. We want to ask what are the equations, what are the values of n for which x squared plus y squared equal to n z squared will have a solution. So the Pythagorean triple was corresponding to the n equal to one case. So now we want to see which which n equal to for, for which values of n this will have a solution. And the answer is uh, can will it have solution for it? So all integers n? And the answer is no. So, for example, there is an there is an equation x squared plus y squared equal to three z squared, which will not have any solutions. To see this, we will uh, check this equation congruent to mod three. We will check this integer equation congruent to modulo three. And uh, in modulo three, as we can see, if both are congruent to zero mod three, then x squared plus y squared is congruent to zero mod three. Uh, is congruent to uh, like x squared and y. If both are divisible by three, then x squared and y squared are divisible by nine, which means z squared is divisible by three, which means z is divisible by 3 which means z square is divisible by 9 which means the gcd is no longer 1. this is the similar type of argument that we use in proving root 2 is rational so both of these are not uh, one cannot be congruent to 0 mod 3 and the other plus minus 1 because then 3z square becomes congruent to 1 mod 3 which is false because 3z square is divisible by 3 it is congruent to 0 mod 3 both can't be plus minus 1 mod 3 because then 3z square becomes 2 mod 3 so this doesn't have this just can't have any integer solutions except 0 0 0 which we said we will not uh, consider so this doesn't have any integer solution. This brings us to the question that what are the integers for which this has a solution? And I'll leave this as an exercise. And this is a little difficult exercise in the previous one. There is a very concise argument. There is a very concise answer to this to, to this question. And then we will also want to ask what is the closed form expression for the general M. But uh, like there's a very beautiful solution. There's a very beautiful answer to this question. What are the values of N for which this equation will have a solution? Like I'll be very proud of you if you can write down the values of write down what n for what n we will you are having solutions and then spot a pattern in those n. So that will be that will be a very nice thing to try out. So now that we have an answer to x squared plus y squared equal to n z squared, we will generalize it further and we will ask a the uh, whether the integer solution a x squared plus b y squared equal to c z squared has integer solutions or not. So to do that, this one uh, basically corresponds to finding a rational point on the ellipse a x squared plus b y squared equal to c and this equation uh, the answer to this question turns out to be much more difficult than the last one so 
we will there's a lot of literature surrounding this but we will only give the theorem that solves it all at, all at one go so that theorem is due to the genius of lezada you may know lezada from lezada polynomials this is the same lezada and he says that this equation will have a solution in integers not not equal to zero of course if there even only if <clears throat> there is an m depending on a simple fashion in abc so that a x squared plus b y squared congruent to c z squared modulo m has solution in integers x y z relatively prime to m <clears throat> we can there's one more theorem due to hasse which states this same thing a little more advanced uh, in a very in a in a much more beautiful way in a much more elegant way and this theorem due to hasse is that a homogeneous quadratic equation in several variable is solvable in, in integers if and only if it is solvable in real numbers and it is solvable in periodic numbers for each prime p so don't panic i am not going deep into it this is here just for the show so once we have hasse's theorem lejeda's theorem is a, just a trivial corollary of hasse's theorem so this is this turns out this this for some reason mathematicians believe that this is much more elegant than the other one so now we generalize it further and we goes to go to fermat's last theorem fermat's last theorem is as you know is trying is uh, to see whether the equation x to the power n plus y to the power n equal to z to the power n will have solutions in integers n greater than 2 So x cube plus y cube equal to z cube is in particular the first non-trivial case of Fermat's last theorem. So Fermat, as you know, had a solution for the n equal to four case. He didn't have a solution for the n equal to three case. So well, uh, he did, he may may have a solution like it's it's that margin thing, but we'll not go into it. So x cube plus y cube equal to z cube has an integer solution or not? And this is equivalent to finding whether x cube plus y cube equal to one has rational solution or not. But as we have pointed out earlier, that is x cube plus y cube equal to one. This is not a quadratic. This is this is a cubic, and a ration and a line and a cubic. First of all, they don't intersect at only two points. They intersect at more than two points. They intersect at three points. And secondly, as we know, not all general conics satisfy the property that two rational conics or a rational conic and a rational line will meet at rational points. So. This kind of says that uh, this cannot be handled as geometrically as was as the last case. So this cannot be handled in this way. But we can do something better. We can study the rational points on this conic, as I'll discuss in the next slide. So the question is, why are we studying rational points? Uh, there are other ways to find the Pythagorean triples as well. So why are we studying rational points? Well, rational points have got a lot of literature, mathematical literature of its own. one very specific use is the rational points on elliptic curves elliptic curves uh, are some of my uh, one of my uh, areas are uh, one of my areas of interest elliptic curves are curves of the form y square equal to a cubic in x or in other words a root over of a cubic in y equal to a root over of a cubic in x so elliptic curves typically look like these two these two pictures that you can see either an elliptic curve will be one will have only one component and look like the uh, right side one or it can have two components and look like the left side one so we we want to see what are all the rational points on the elliptic curves uh, on on any on a given elliptic curve so <clears throat> these rational points have got a beautiful structure of their own and the uh, structure is that if there are two rational points p and q you join these two rational points you extend it to meet the conic at r you drop a perpendicular from r and you allow that perpendicular to meet the rational point again at another point and you define that point to be p plus q so this is how you add two rational points on a conic this is you may not name it addition if you are uncomfortable with addition you can name it some other operation but this is an operation named addition which takes p and q to this point according to the geometry just described and if you define addition in this way it can be shown that the rational points on an elliptic curve form a group structure and a group is a set satisfying certain properties certain useful properties and there are there's a there's a whole lot of literature of, about this rational points on the elliptic curves one of very elementary theorems being one of my very favorite theorems and it's called model theorem something that still continues to surprise me and model theorem says that if this group that is generated by the elliptic that there is generated by the rational points on an elliptic curve is finitely generated which means that if you have any two any a finite there is a finite set of points which can generate all other rational points using this uh, using this operation of addition so <clears throat> this is where i'll like to stop i'll mention that this is not only because of the beauty that we are starting it elliptic curves have got a lot of uses of their own one of them being that it's used used a lot in cryptography 
and cryptography as you know are keeping your mail safe and cryptography is what is keeping your emails unsafe but well you know what i mean so these elliptic curves are used in cryptography very much uh, apart from many other places where they are used and uh, with that i would like to end my talk today you can't mention everything in 20 minutes i hope i could have said more so with that i would like to end my talk thank you please feel free to ask anything you want to from this talk thank you thank you shayan thank you so much for that lovely talk uh, now i would like to ask the audience if anybody has any questions you can either post it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask it yeah so can i ask one question yeah absolutely please go ahead yeah so uh, first of all thank you for the wonderful talk so my question is that in one of your slides you mentioned uh, one theorem of haze so my point is so when you are taking any elliptic curve as you mentioned in the last slide of yours uh, let us say we take any the field of the rational numbers so can we have uh, any um, let's say a bound or any formula for the number of rational points occurring on an elliptic curve or in general any algebraic curve uh as as you have seen in the circle the number of rational points is infinity like there are yeah, infinite number of, of rational points yes so in an elliptic curve uh, an elliptic curve also in general has an infinite number of rational points that's why the theorem due to hasse which says uh, the theorem due to model which says that it's finitely generated okay uh, I, i don't think uh, there are any bounds for any general curve uh, if there are i don't know about it i don't think okay so. okay Okay, and another point is that you just briefly mentioned about the Fermat's last theorem. So, is there any connection between the Fermat's last theorem and the elliptic curve? So, if if, uh, if does there exist any link? No, the thing is, you can study uh, rational points on. Uh, if you want to, you can uh, sort of study points on the qubit, but yeah. uh, those are not as useful as the rational points on elliptic curves. Elliptic curves are okay. what are hmm. the most important thing in, like most important thing to study rational points. Yeah, so yeah. The elliptic curves that we generally deal with when starting with rational points, when when doing rational points. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Flora. Thank you for the question. Is there any other question from the audience? Okay. I think we can move on to our reviewers then. Uh, The first reviewer, uh, Dr. Shulalit Bandhpatha. Shulalit, the if you would please like to address. Oh, maybe I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Shulalit, the yes. I repeat you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we can Great. see you as well. Hmm. Thank you, uh, Sharon, for <clears throat> a good presentation. I think it was uh, very nice to have the interactivity that you had with uh, showing these uh, equations. That was a that was very nice. Uh, but I would start a bit with some inputs from my side, and let's see uh, <clears throat> how it goes. So the first important thing what I felt was that uh, you you came back to it a bit later in the. in your presentation you mentioned that you have been asked to give a more elementary talk which can uh, yeah which can go to different parts of the audience but to me it felt that you should have kind of done that a very early in the presentation when you started the reason i would say so is that for me it was a bit difficult to understand just from your first slide what is the exact purpose of the talk uh partly saying that uh, if you were you you went back and forth discussing about uh, this is something that i'm going to avoid this is something that we know but what would have been very nice is if you could have shown uh, if you could have structured the talk primarily for this particular uh, event let's say it it seemed like that you had a lot of nice data but unless we are able to communicate the data to this audience your hard work will will not be completely appreciated so what i'm trying to say is that i know that you're quite early in your presentation days and uh, these inputs can help you build uh, build a lot on when you present in such a forum that's important to state that this is the purpose of my talk and 
the way we are going to end the talk or we are going to go through this, this and this thing. So an outline, an overview would have been very nice because it felt like I, I didn't completely understand when, where to focus uh, through your talk since I'm kind of a general audience uh, evaluating your presentation. So that was the first one that I wanted to say that there was a missing outline, there was a missing overview of the talk and there was a missing uh, stress on what is the purpose of the talk. The second thing which I liked very much, as I said, is that you had these uh, interactive tools that you kind of shared both your presentation and some tool where one can see visually. This, this was really good because that helps someone to you know, get back attention, even if uh, you are uh, wandering away a bit. So those tools were very nice. But uh, what I felt was that you could have uh, presented those a bit more in detail regarding, uh, because maybe not all the tools that you have used for your own research uh, or your own presentation are not essentially known to everyone. So I would have liked if you had said, okay, this is a tool where you can you know, do these kind of things so that the audience who is also a generalist audience here can get inputs and say, okay, maybe I can use it for my own uh, work as well. So that kind of a thing could have come in because you went directly to show what you have done. So that was this was a very good part, uh, the interactivity. Then I would uh, bring you to uh, the speed a bit and the tempo of your talk. I felt that it was quite fast and at some places also due to the fact that it's there were some technical disruptions, it was difficult to follow. Uh, we lost some parts of it. And of course, one can read through the slide and be a bit, be a bit less critical. But remember, your 20 minutes are uh, the time that you have all together to gain the attention of the audience. So if you lose out your audience once or twice uh, in such a digital platform, it is often very difficult to get them back. So it's important to kind of repeat some of the concepts when you go along and also to uh, focus on the speed because uh, I'm not sure what uh, the other reviewer would uh, talk about the tempo, but for me it was a bit on the faster side. But that doesn't uh, that doesn't always uh, that should not be the thing that would be concerning in in other forums. But this was one more comment, and the final thing uh, that I would like to say is that at this stage it was. Uh, very difficult for me to understand whether this is your independent contribution or this was more of a joint contribution because you use the word we often, but I couldn't see any of your team members on any of your slides or people who have been working closely with you. So if it was an uh, individual work, your the appreciation you will get from the audience is uh, different than if this was a teamwork or if this was more of a a mixture of literature versus what you have contributed to in this field. So it's very important to have that kind of a slide. Uh, beginning, end, doesn't matter. Uh, you have different ways of uh, showing this acknowledgement to people who have been working in the team. And uh, that, that often gives more trust in the data that you're presenting. Because again, if you're presenting to such a generalist audience with not only mathematicians, but also from different fields, it's important that uh, they can trust the data. And, and in this way, uh, more formalizing the collaborations that you have with the team that you're working with is, is good to present. And the last thing, uh, just as a thank you note, that it, this was very nice uh, information and knowledge that you shared, but there is, a, there, there is many things that you should think back when it comes to communicating the message to the audience. Your 20 minutes is what you should plan the talk for and also not end. Uh, the ending was very abrupt. It, uh, I was expecting more. Uh, and you said that uh, I, I could have used more time uh, if I had more time to say a uh, lot more, but it's much better to kind of plan what you want to say given the time you have. Yeah, I think uh, I would stop there. And uh, thank you once again for a very nice talk. Thank you, Dr. Pandubadha. Thank you for your valuable inputs. I'm sure Shayan had a lot to learn from them. 
Um, moving on to our second reviewer, Dr. Sanyal. If you would Hi. kindly let us know your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. so uh, so Shulalit actually nicely summed up most of these and uh, I actually made some points that would basically be details of uh, some of the uh, points that he made. So I'll just quickly run through them. And then, then we, I think we mostly agree. So I, I have been to talks from people which are being given in a math department versus a talk that is given in a journalist audience. And there are sometimes differences in expectation uh, from those two audiences. Uh, but I think, uh, I, 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 I mean, I speak from experience that there are parts of this talk that would not be well aligned with any of those audiences. So those are the points uh, for improvement. Uh, so first of all, the whole talk was bottom up, which sometimes works great with like when you're presenting in a math department. So you start with the kernel or the basic core of the idea, and then you slowly expand and talk about the applications and you end with, uh, for example, saying that you can go all the way up to the applications and cryptography and all that. But for a general audience, and in fact, you know, just in general to, to have more uh, sort of to uh, get more audience attention, it's better to do things bottom up, I feel, uh, where you, you know, you almost start with the fact that I want to talk about things today that are related to uh, things all the way up to the Fermat's last theorem or cryptography. Uh, and it's, it's okay to sensationalize a little bit over there, uh, because those are not like things that you are presenting from your work, you're just talking about how far the applications of what you show today are can be. Um, and then you slowly narrow down and down in the first few slides, and then you plug in the assumptions and say that, okay, so that was the bigger picture, but we're going to start with a very small problem that we're going to solve today. Um, and then through the different slides, you build up all the way up to this most general problem. You don't necessarily solve it because that's the hardest problem, but you show how you know, one can form a sort of cogent connection of ideas that can lead all the way up to solving these hard problems. Um, uh, so, so I think that could really help with the general audience, making it more bottom up than top down. Uh, sorry, the other way around, making it more top down. Um, and a table of contents is highly, highly necessary in such cases. Uh, you know, when uh, you're you're going to, uh, if you do a bottom up talk, when you're when you've uh, uh, illustrated the main idea, the main problem, but then you go in series, sort of tackling more general problems, increasing the general generality a little bit at a time. Um, sometimes the audience might get lost because of exactly what Shulalita said: is what is the purpose? Where is this going? So if you state the purpose up front and then also show a table of contents, that would be really, really useful. Um, I also really enjoyed the animations and uh, the interaction, interact, uh, interactive tools you used for the different, uh, uh, showing the different things. There's one problem though. Uh, if you're going to have a very an interaction heavy talk, then I, would ha I have two suggestions. Either try uh, having the animations inside your presentation because in a time bound format, going in and out of your slides sometimes can just like lead you to like, you know, miss the time deadline. Um, so if possible, have all of the animations inside your slides with proper annotations, or uh, as this is the more bolder solution, consider a Jupyter notebook, consider giving an entire talk from a Jupyter notebook. It's, it's a little hard, but people have done it in the past. So, uh, and if you're unfamiliar with Jupyter Notebooks, I, I highly encourage you to check them out. They're, they're a mixed form of coding and text so and pictures. Um, so if your talk is very going to be very, very mathematical diagrams, equations, and figures only, and not a lot of other kinds of animation, then you could try and do it entirely from such an interactive format. Um, so, and just in addition to that, on most of the figures, you need more annotations not just pointing out what the coordinates are, but just saying that this point is important or this is, uh, this is a rational point on the line. So all of these points could be mapped onto the line. Things like that, when you say in words, sometimes get a little drier because you know, I, I, you're asking the audience to figure things out. You're asking the audience to figure too many things out at that point. Um, and this is especially, this was also, uh, I noticed with the modulo arithmetic things, you're, you're, you're you know, asking the audience to work out things. Um, that that 
that just they're not going to do that in the 2020 format. And with the conversation, again, it sounded like an intense thesis defense, right? You're asking the audience, if they, you, you're telling the audience if they believe you, and then saying, if you don't believe me, you know, go figure this out for yourself. But the audience probably does believe you, and they want to believe you, right? So, so then, uh, you know, you should uh, sort of, uh, maybe not uh, put, put in those terms in the conversation. Same with when you are uh, going through an entire proof, right? I'm still just looking at the things on, your, on the slide. So I'm, I'm actually not going with you through the proof. So don't do that. Just, just focus on the main idea on the slide and stress on the importance. You don't have to take the audience through the entire proof. And again, these can be, this particular thing can be one of those things that's different between a math audience or a math department. Uh, seminar versus a general audience. So taking into account the uh, differences in audience. Um, uh, and uh, in general, just, you know, you show Hassel's theorem in the end, you say it's just for the show. Generally, don't show things that will not go through in detail, that will not understand uh, or explain uh, the, to the audience, and so the audience will not understand. Um, and uh, so, you know, for other theorems also, you know, if you say something like it surprises you, you know, you're just beautiful, you should try and show why. And uh, I'll just then summarize and bring in this one thing by saying there are a set of excellent YouTube videos by this uh, channel called Three Blue, One Brown. Uh, they, they are particularly the kind of talks, the specialize in the kind of talks that you gave today. It's a combination between geometry, number theory, math, and all that. And they have spectacular animations over there, right? Uh, try and look at some of those animations and see if you can like re repeat some of those when talking about general ideas like this. And I feel if you look at this from a perspective of how many figures I have to make to sort of drill in a particular concept to the audience so that they look at like two slides and immediately they have got it, you'll see that it becomes a very hard job and it'll help you plan how much results and what to show to the audience. Because if you have to make three very painfully complicated animations you will then immediately realize then, okay, let me sort of get the gist out of this. And if it can be expressed in a single animation, it's a lot less hard work, let me just do that. So that can sort of serve as a metronome and guide you towards how to extract the gist from uh, some of the less organized parts of the talk. Um, yeah, and so that's, that's, those are the details I had. Thank you, doc uh, Dr. Sanyal. Thank you for your inputs. Uh, once again, I would like to thank Shion for his talk. Uh, now we will move on to the second and final speaker of today's evening, and that is Shrija. I had already introduced her, but once again, let me reiterate. The talk, uh, the talk is titled as Photonics Crystals and Its Applications. Shrija is a young JV scholar uh, of the year 2019 and she's currently an undergrad student in the University of Calcutta, and she's pursuing a BTEC in optics and optoelectronics engineering. Shrija, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Uh, so hi uh, to all the JVS PDF members uh, present here. And uh, like, I would like to introduce myself as uh, Srija Datta, an undergrad student in the University of Calcutta pursuing a BTEC in optics and optical electronics engineering. And uh, I'm a JB scholar of 2019. And uh, the topic that I'm going to present today is photonic crystals and its applications. So uh, let's uh, pay due respect towards the scientist uh, who introduced this topic. Uh, Professor Eli Abna Woodpin, which the, he is regarded as the father of the photonic band gap concept, and uh, he coined the term photonic crystal. The geometrical structure of the first experimentally realized photonic band gap is sometimes called Yablo 1. So, uh, what sort of material can afford us complete control over light propagation? To answer this question, we rely on an analogy with our successful electronic materials. A crystal is a periodic arrangement of atoms or molecules. The pattern with which the atoms or molecules are repeated in space is the crystal lattice. Now, lattice can also prohibit the propagation of certain waves. 
uh, there may be gaps in the energy band structure of the crystal. This gap may extend to several propagation directions, resulting in a complete band gap. Now, the optical analog is, photon is photonic crystal in which the atoms or molecules are replaced by microscopic media with uh, differing dielectric constants, and the periodic potential is replaced by a periodic dielectric function. And uh, we can design photonic crystals with uh, photonic band gaps, preventing light from propagating in certain directions with specified frequencies. And uh, here is an image of a photonic crystal. So uh, photonic crystals can be chiefly of uh, three types, 1D, 2D, and 3D. So here is a diagram showing the various types. Now let's focus on each. First is the 1D photonic crystal. And uh, the simplest possible photonic crystal consists of alternating layers of materials with different dielectric constants, that is a multi-layer film. And uh, these materials are periodic in the Z direction and uh, homogeneous in the XY plane. So to produce one dimensional photonic crystal, Thin film layers of different dielectric constant may be periodically deposited on a surface, which leads to a band gap in a particular propagation direction, such as normal to the surface. A Bragg rating shown here is an example of this type of photonic crystal. One dimensional photonic crystal can in include layers of nonlinear optical materials in which the. Hello, am I audible? Yes, your audible, Shrija. Please continue. Thank you. So one-dimensional photonic crystal can include layers of nonlinear optical materials in which the nonlinear behavior is accentuated due to field enhancement at wavelengths near a so-called degenerate band age. And this field enhancement in terms of intensity can reach where n is the total number of layers. However, by using layers which include an optically anisotropic material, it has been shown that the field enhancement can reach, which in conjunction with nonlinear optics has potential applications such as the development of an all optical switch. A one-dimensional photonic crystal can be implemented using repeated alternating layers of a metamaterial in a vacuum. And recently, uh, the researchers fabricated a graphene-based Bragg rating, a one-dimensional photonic crystal, and demonstrated that it uh, supports excitation of surface electromagnetic waves in the periodic structure by using 633 nanometer helium neon laser as a light source. Besides, a novel type of one-dimensional graphene dielectric photonic crystal has also been proposed. This structure can act as a far higher filter and can support low loss surface plasmas of wave guidance sensing applications. So 1D photonic crystals doped with bioactive metals like silver have been also proposed as sensing devices for bacterial contaminants. Similar planar 1D photonic crystals made of polymers have been used to detect volatile organic compounds, vapors in atmosphere. Now, in addition to solid phase photonic crystals, some liquid crystals with uh, defined ordering can demonstrate photonic color. For example, studies have shown several liquid crystals with uh, short and long range one dimensional positional ordering can form photonic structures. Um, the next is a 2D photonic crystal. Now in two dimensional photonic crystals, holes may be drilled in a substrate that is transparent to the wavelength of radiation that the band gap is designed to block. Triangular and square lattices of holes have been successfully employed. So here is a diagram of holy fiber or photonic crystal fiber that can be made 
by taking cylindrical rods, rods of glass in hexagonal lattice and then heating and stretching them, the triangle-like air gaps between the glass rods become the holes that confine the molds. And this is the third type 3D phonic crystal. And there are several structures types that uh, have been constructed. Uh, for example, spheres in a diamond lattice, yablonovite, the wood pile structure, inverse opal or inverse colloidal crystal spheres. So uh, like the wood, wood pile structure, their rods are repeatedly etched with uh, beam lithography filled in and covered with a layer of new material. Now, as the process repeats, the channels etched in each layer are perpendicular to the layer below and parallel to and out of phase with the channels to layer below. The process repeats until the structure is of the desired height. The fill-in material is then dissolved using an agent that dissolves the fill-in material but not the deposition material. Uh, now, it is generally hard to introduce defects into the structure. And uh, for this one, like uh, it can be allowed to deposit into a cubic closed packed lattice suspended in a solvent and then a hardener is introduced that makes a transparent solid out of the volume occupied by the solvent and the spheres are then dissolved with an acid such as hydrochloric acid. Uh, now the photonic crystal cavities uh, not only band gap, photonic crystals may have another effect if we partially remove the symmetry through the creation of nano size cavity. This defect allows you to guide or to trap the light with the same function as nanophotonic resonator and um, it is characterized by the strong dielectric modulation in the photonic crystals. Then photonic crystal uh, fabrication process. Here are the various steps shown here, uh, which is done to in order to fabricate the photonic crystal, like patterning of substrates to improve ordering, deposition of a photosensitive layer, definition of structures, that is lithography, then etching to the structures, resist removal, then deposition of further upper optical layers. So in this way, it, uh, proceeds. Then there are several fabrication challenges. High dimensional photonic crystal fabrication faces two major challenges, making them with enough precision to prevent scattering losses, blurring the crystal properties, and uh, designing processes that can robustly mass produce the crystals. Then computing a photonic band gap structure the photonic band gap is essentially the gap between the air line and the dielectric line in the dispersion relation of the PBG system. To design photonic crystal system, it is essential to engineer the location and size of the band gap by computational modeling using any of the following methods. Uh, for example, like the plane wave expansion method, finite element method, then uh, finite difference time domain method, order and spectral method. And uh, we obtain uh, such a kind of electromagnetic bands using uh, all these techniques. And let's explain each one of them. Like uh, plane wave expansion method refers to a computational technique in uh, electromagnetics to solve the Maxwell's equations by formulating an eigenvalue problem out of the equation. Now, this is basically used in photonic crystal as a method of solving the band structure of specific photonic crystal geometries. Then uh, FEM method is a popular method for numerically solving the differential equations arising in engineering and mathematical modeling. Typical problems, uh, problem areas of interests include the traditional fields of structural analysis, uh, heat transfer, fluid flow, uh, mass transport, electromagnetic potential, and it is used in this field also. Then finite difference time domain, 
it's a numerical analysis technique used for modeling computational electrodynamics and since it's a time domain method uh, fdtd solutions can cover a wide frequency range with a single simulation run and treat nonlinear material properties in a natural way then spectral methods the fourth type uh, are a class of techniques used in uh, applied mathematics and to numerically solve certain differential equations potentially involving the use of faster Fourier transform. And uh, to, the idea is to write the solution of the differential equation as a sum of certain basic functions. And uh, we can thus study the structure. So uh, the applications of photonic crystals. One dimensional photonic crystals are already in widespread use in the form of thin film optics with applications from low and high reflection coatings on lenses and mirrors to color changing paints and inks. Then two dimensional ones are beginning to find some commercial applications. Higher dimensional photonic crystals are of great interest for both fundamental and applied research. And here are some of the uh, areas where they are used, for example, wearable sensors, communication, solar cells, laser propagation, network speed. So basically, why did I choose this topic? Uh, so the answer is basically due to interest, curiosity, passion, then this is an emerging new field. So I'll have uh, more to know from this. And why does the world care about this topic? Uh, basically because of its ability to confine light in hollow pores or with confinement characteristics not possible in conventional optical fiber. This PCF is now finding applications in fiber optic communications, then uh, fiber lasers, nonlinear devices, high power transmission, high sensitive gas sensors, and other areas. So uh, that's how I would like to end my speech. If there are any questions, I would like to take them. Thank you, Shrija. Thank you for your presentation. I would now like to ask the audience if they have any questions. You can please unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, so if there are no questions, I think we should move on to our reviewers. Uh, Dr. Bandupadhyay, if you would please let us know your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Srija, for a different kind of presentation than the first one. So uh, first of all, to start a bit on the purpose of the talk or presentation once again. I think if I were you, I would have started your presentation with the last slide first, because that felt where you had, why you had chosen this topic and that gives a bit broader application then of why uh, photonic materials or photonic crystals are so important and then one would, one would do that. So what would be uh, very important when you structure such a talk is that you define uh, why one would give such a talk in the first place. And that is, you could say, photonic crystal materials are so important for this and this applications. And in my own uh, interest, I think that this would be an emerging field and therefore I've chosen to deliver this talk. Such kind of talks are very useful because what uh, if you are able to convince your audience that this is an emerging field, this is a field which needs uh, attention of people, then you already have the audience from your first slide. In this case, you had me mostly at the last slide because all the time I was thinking, why did you choose this topic? So that was, a, that was one of the strong uh, points that I thought would make, this, uh, make your talk a very nice one. Second is that you have uh, mostly uh, got all your data from different sources. And it's a bit surprising that you don't mention any of the sources or references as we call it uh, for the nice figures. I'm presuming that these have not been made by you. And there were also excerpts from textbook uh, literature articles uh, and I couldn't find any references. 
And it, it would be very nice to kind of cite the reference below each of the slide, primarily because this is a presentation. So often presenters like to sum up all of them at the end of the slides, but uh, at the end of the presentation, but that's not a good way of knowing, uh, let's say the authenticity of the reference. So if you have it on the slide where you have taken an image, by looking at that link, people in the audience can also figure out if this is a, uh, and can follow you and trust your work much more. So it's better to use references per slide, but in your case, references were absolutely missing. So this is important for your next presentation. Uh, at some point towards the end, when you had different methods that you were referring to, you went through all the slides. As you might already know that a presentation is a way of you know, keeping your audience with you, not revealing the surprise that you have planned to tell them, uh, and slowly revealing the surprises. So you're doing that in the first part, but suddenly when you came to the methods, you went from one slide to another and you showed all your nice figures that you had, the text that you had, and, and it kind of killed the uh, surprise element in your presentation. One easy way you could have, what you could have done is that you could have had one slide where you had said, okay, these are the different methods I'm going to present now, and they are coming up in the following part. So in that way, you don't show what is in store and it acts as what we call as a cliffhanger. So you, you, you glue your audience to your slide very nicely. And having said that also, I think what was very, very important like the previous speaker is that to have an overview slide and outline slide, because you had, you had theoretical parts, you had different kinds of materials, then you had methods and then you had applications. So it could have been perfect if you had an overview and you also showed as we progress that, okay, now we have covered the first part. So it could have been more uh, to me, this was a more pedagogical lecture where you are trying to uh, share some knowledge that you yourself have gained by reviewing the literature than from your own experience or experiments, let's say. So in such a talk, it would be also nice to have this element of structure, meaning that you show, uh, we are going to cover the four parts in today's lecture. The first part is this and this, the second part is this, then you uh, the, the audience knows how much to expect from such a lecture. The other thing that I felt, or two more things that I would like to point out is that I felt that you had done a very uh, fast job in preparing your presentation slides than actually reviewing the literature. You have read quite a bit. You have tried to understand different concepts also from previous courses, I presume, and also from reviewing the literature. But from your slides, from your presentation, it felt like you had not given enough time to prepare the slides. I may be wrong there because it's just a uh, just an assumption because uh, I would have designed the slides a bit different, uh, uh, both with, uh, let's say, the use of color that you have taken, the text size, the some, some parts were underlined. Uh, one could have easily used some animation. And as we all are preparing presentations every day, we know that when we are, struggling to make the slides in time, then we are avoiding the, uh, the, let's say the additional parts to it, which makes the presentation interesting in, 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 in many different ways. So for example, if you wanted to show some important message, you could have brought it in through an animation or you could have just covered up that part and removed that animation. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, and you could have used, of course, other forms of presentation besides a PowerPoint, but I felt that there, were, there could have been much more work uh, that could have gone in preparing the presentation, especially when you are trying to deliver an important message which you, uh, which you chose that there, why is there a need for such kind of materials and what's, the, what's going to be the future effect if we use these materials. So the topic was important, very relevant to the, to the event but the message delivery was not very clear, according to me. And finally, as a roundup, I think uh, since you have reviewed a lot of literature, I think you also had a nice learning from other people's works, from textbooks, from literature available. Uh, you could have been, I felt that you could have been a bit more enthusiastic in uh, showing what you have learned. Like, so you could have said, 
these people have worked on uh, such and such materials and they found that these were the fabrication challenges, right? So if you had that a bit of connection to the literature and a connection to the audience, I think it would have become much more personal, uh, your presentation than this one, which was more like, uh, I felt that it was a, uh, of course, we all uh, read from textbooks and literature and present it, but it felt that the people from the textbook are uh, owning all of it, but you don't, you haven't verified if their ownership is correct or not, if you get my point. So it's, it's more about owning what you're presenting that I felt was, was a bit missing. Yeah, other than that, I think it was a very good topic and a good job done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bandhubadha, uh, for your inputs. Now we'll move on to uh, Dr. Sanya. If you would please let us know your thoughts about Shrija's presentation. Uh, yeah, so uh, Shrija, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it, was a, it was a nice uh, sort of review through history of how this field is developed and, and uh, where it is going today and, and why uh, some of the more recent uh, developments are important because it's an emerging field. Um, but my first point is exactly the same, uh, would resonate with Shulolita, your last slide should have opened with that. So the, uh, and, and uh, again, in a talk like this, it's also, it's even more important, I think, to be, make it top down. So you let the audience know what they're expecting and what uh, the things uh, that we'll be going through today. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on some uh, like details that I noticed about general things about slide design and stuff like that. So the first thing is, is text. So one of my committee members used to say that Power, like you need to go on a PowerPoint diet. Texts and bullet points are like empty calories. You don't need them or you don't need too much of them. What you need is more pictures and more animations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Especially when you are communicating complex ideas about, uh, you know, complex ideas that span a long range. So for example, there's things about mathematical models and, and plots produced out of those kinds of modeling. And then again, there is things about a particular instrument design and a particular process design. So when you have a talk that um, so combines all of these different ideas together to just present some of them as texts, it becomes very, very hard for, the, for me to grasp and I'm sure it's equally hard for the audience. Um, and, uh, and, and so the organizing things by text also you know, is the number one way to make it incoherent, really. For example, uh, when you show that you, you have these three slides, which is the 1D, 2D, and 3D uh, uh, devices, um, you have a lot of ideas on the slide that are organized by bullet points. And the bullet points themselves are incoherent. Consider alternatives to organize ideas by. Such alternatives could be ideas, General, like single idea, general topics, or even chronologies, which would be really uh, important and interesting in a, in a review like this. So if you can organize things according to either history or a, a group of ideas, which I call a topic in this case, or even a particular idea, then it would be sort of the, the message of the slide would immediately spring out to the audience versus when you are going through a long list of things that, you know, I have a hard time figuring out what are the connections between these? Why are these bullet points in the same slide uh, uh, that talks about 1D, uh, uh, 1D materials. So I think it's necessary to make some of the slides more specific like that. Um, and, uh, so, and, and then uh, the use of animations is definitely something that you would need to consider. For example, when you are describing an entire process like the construction of 3D crystals, if you could find a video on the internet that actually walks through that process or it could be an actual video where like people are explaining things uh, or it could be a video sort, sort of like an animation that shows the processes and you play the video and you speak alongside it that that could be a much better way to deliver uh, such a you know talk about the process or uh, but if you're not unable to find something like this then you can uh, you know actually make uh, sort of the process diagram however um, however rudimentary might it be, but, act, but at least you can have the different parts and you can sort of uh, show how the system goes from process A to process B to process C and so on. 
so that the audience, you know, kind of relives that uh, diagram with you and is able to appreciate it better. Uh, uh, when you mention challenges, it would be very nice to find examples of or images of people meeting or failing to meet those challenges. And a simple example is, uh, so this is back from my undergrad chemi days when uh, I had to communicate hotspots and reactors to people. I str struggled for a very long time to explain that here is a temperature point in a vessel that's hot or cold and it affects the output of the product and people didn't pay attention. But one time I just mentioned the word uh, Chernobyl reactor blast and meltdown and immediately people realized what I'm talking about. So that, that's an example of like, you know, you were talking about a challenge, uh, just mention a very relatable example of people failing to meet or actually meeting the challenge and how that has shaped the field. Uh, and if there is, there is a very important result there, something to be learned from that, maybe it led to the construction of a new device, a new method or a new model, uh, then that is what, the, you know, that is the place to plug that in. Um, and uh, there was, again, it's about organization, but you need a story here. And one thing you can do is uh, in review talks, in, in talks when you review an article or a field, a story is, I feel, somewhat easier to derive because you know when you were, were doing some original contribution, there's a lot of topics that you have in your head and it's your job to sort of narrate them in a way that's coherent and makes the story, has a logical flow of ideas. When you are reviewing literature, um, a very easy way to just fall back on the history. Just look at the ideas as they developed over time and use that to set the story. If you have an even better way of organizing or making a story, go for it. But if you don't, then act and just following the history sometimes, um, you know, we all like to look at scientific documentaries that like are the histories of the field. And so if you can bring that element in reviews like review presentations like this, I feel that would be a very, very nice way to present it. Um, and uh, I, I think you can maybe go read a few uh, review papers, just, just realize how reviews are written and constructed. That might help you uh, better design review slides. So yeah, those, those are the points I had. Thank you, Dr. Shanya. Uh... I think it's uh, just the four of us over here. Thank you once again, Srija, for that uh, talk. Uh, you're a young scholar, so I'm sure the inputs given by Dr. Sanyal and Dr. Bandhavadhyay were helpful for you. Uh, so I think we would close the session. However, I, uh, Dr. Sanyal, is uh, is this your first time here, Tanmayda? Uh, as it one is. Of it okay, is, so, yes. Yeah, we've had Shulalitha quite a number of times now. So he's also given us a talk as to how to give an effective presentation uh, that is that has served as uh, the template for everyone uh, who has given a talk. We actually attach it with the invitation to our speakers. So uh, I would like to know how your experience was uh, and we would love to have you back again. Exactly. Uh, so I, I actually have, uh, I missed the session, Shulalinda, but I have uh, heard the talk later on. And it, 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 it also helps me a lot. So thank you for doing that. Um, my experience uh, today was, was very good. And I would definitely be, uh, I would definitely love to be back uh, for you know, more sessions like this. So uh, yeah, and it's, it's definitely uh, like, you know, sometimes uh, when, I'm, when it's easy to sort of in these reviews think that, oh, okay, why was it designed like this? This is standard, why was it done like this? But then, uh, I'm, I'm also trying to sort of go back to my undergrad days when I was, you know, kind of more naive in presentations to think from that mm -hmm. point of view. Uh, and so that, that really uh, sort of also helps me uh, deliver a better review, I guess. Uh, but but it, I, I, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I hope I've been able to communicate that some, some of the things that as you, you know, this holds for both of the presenters today, as you like go up in years, you realize some things that are almost like taken as standards uh, that, you know, slowly, it's also part of the learning process, like you learn theorems and ideas and, and processes from textbook. These are also things that you learn uh, as you go up, uh, as you increase and give more and more presentations. So, yeah, I, I would love to, you know, have more sessions like this. Uh, so. Thank you. Uh, it was lovely having you, really.
Uh, Shalalitha, would you like to add something? Or... No, I think uh, even though I have been here in these type of sessions uh, quite many times, but it's also good to see that uh, there are so many things to learn from these presentations as well. Uh, mm -hmm in a way that uh, we often struggle to communicate some of the messages, but some, some, some of the JB scholars, they do it so nicely. So it's, it's, it's not just criticism or uh, all the time, but it's also quite learning from these presentations. So I'd like it uh, to come back again and again. Yeah. So thank you for keeping on organizing these kind of sessions. Yes, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Shrija, once again. I think we'll close today's session. Goodbye, everyone, and have a nice time.